Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Peter Conti. Thanks for being on the show, Peter. Hey, great to be here. All of you listening in, great to be here with you. Awesome. Glad to have you, Peter. Uh, Peter started investing in real estate in, in 1990. Went from auto mechanic to self-made millionaire in three and a half years. I know there's a lot of listeners that would, they would love to be in those shoes, so, you know, moving, uh, you know, from that day job to, you know, three and a half years to a millionaire. I mean, he's helped thousands of real estate investors through his books, courses, and mentoring. Now, mostly retired, Peter selects a handful of people to mentor each year. Well, Peter, you know, again, thank you for your time and being on the show and sharing your expertise with the listeners. Uh, but tell them a little more about who you are, what your focus is, and, and let's figure out how you went from, you know, auto mechanic to millionaire in three and a half years and how us and some of the listeners can do the same. Awesome. Well, I don't know if we can cover that whole thing in the podcast, but we'll do what we Talk can. Talk real I, fast. I just, <laughs> I just want to reach out to all of you on the show here and just say welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us. The fact that you're listening to the show lets me know that you're someone who wants to do more and, and be bigger, bigger and broader with your life. Uh, and that's where I was as an auto mechanic. I, well, I enjoyed being a mechanic. I wanted to do other big things. And uh, I found that real estate was the, the, the avenue that I took, and I'm so thankful that I did. And Back when I got started, Whitney, I, I didn't have a lot of the stuff that's out there now. I mean, there's all these apps and systems and things that can help you find properties and connect with owners and, and automatically send them messages and things. And the one technique I had learned was if you, if you call up enough property owners and you ask them if they would be willing to help out with the financing or, or carry back a note, would they have any interest in that or you know, would they probably hate that idea? Not super fancy, not <laughs> sophisticated by any means, but I could do that much. And so I started going through ads and, and uh, calling numbers and talking to property owners and basically would ask them a little bit of information about the property and then spring the big quick question on them. Uh, you know, gosh, I'm, I don't know if you'd be interested in this or not, but would you be interested in, in maybe helping out by carrying back the financing? If they told me no, I thanked them for a time and hung up. If they said yes, I... I stayed with them and, and kept moving forward to see what we could put together. Wow. So, so why real estate though? You know, you're a mechanic, you know, what you enjoyed that and what, why real estate, what pushed you towards real estate specifically? Well, I think one of the biggest things was I, I took the time to see where I was headed. I actually went out and visited people that had been auto mechanics their entire life. You know, these people that maybe they owned their own gas station by then or whatever. And what, what I saw, saw were people, who were older and kind of worn out from working with their own hands all their life and not really that much further ahead than I was at that point in time. And while my main focus wasn't money for money's sake, I did know that if you had money, it could help you to achieve many of the other things that you want to do in your life. And that's, that's why I went after real estate. Um, coming from a family with seven kids, I, my, I didn't have the ability to go through college. I didn't have a lot of opportunities. I could you know, work as a mechanic, I could work in a warehouse or something, or I could take a shot at this real estate thing. And what I told myself, and this may be helpful to some of you listening, is that if someone else can do it, then it may take me a while to figure out how they did it or find my own pathway. But if someone else could do it, I knew that I could too. Great advice. Uh, and and uh, as long as we're moving forward, right? It may not be as fast as somebody else, but as long as you're moving forward, you're better today or tomorrow than you were yesterday. Yeah. So, so, you know, you, but you got into that first deal and, you know, how quickly then, you know, did you make this decision to go into real estate, you know, from your, from being a mechanic to, you know, till the time you said, okay, you know, I can really do this full time and make a business. Yeah, I actually, uh, when I got started, I, I kind of knew that I wanted to do it and knew that I just needed to get over that hurdle of having my first deal done and nothing fancy on the first deal. I found a, a, a broker, his name was Don. He found a duplex of all things, you know, not very big property, but at least a multi-unit property. He said it was a good deal. I didn't know for sure. It was a special program at that time that was a HUD program where it was 5% down for investors. And I just went ahead and bought that thing. And the, the crazy thing about it is I had a goal of doing 100 units that, that first year. And I bought that property in March 
and I was looking at lots of properties, making offers, analyzing, you know, going up and checking the roof, that type of thing. But I got all the way to August and I hadn't bought any more properties. And luckily a friend of mine, Dan, came along and kind of confronted me on it and said, hey, I thought you were doing this real estate thing. Is it really, really going to be working for you or not? And I had hesitated on getting some help. I'm the type of person that, as you maybe can tell so far in our conversation here, I just want to get in there and try and figure out how to do it on my own. And I had a chance earlier to work with a mentor. Uh, the mentor's fee at that time wasn't a lot. It was $5,000. But for someone who made $25,000, $30,000 a year as a mechanic, $5,000 was a lot of money. And I finally realized when my friend pointed out that day that from my perspective as an auto mechanic, the fee for my mentor was, was a huge amount of money. But for the amount of money in a real estate deal, I mean, you know, you and the people listening to this call, I mean, we put together syndication deals all the time where the attorney fees alone can be twenty, twenty five thousand dollars on a deal. It's you know, it's just change on a on a big commercial deal. Wow. So 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 your friend helped really change, you know, your way of thinking about that five thousand dollars. You decided to pursue some mentoring. Is that yeah, what and I, I got a guy, his name was Keith, and uh, unfortunately he's no longer with us, but he, he pointed, pointed me in the right direction, helped me with some things that are really, you know, not huge obstacles. To, nowadays, you can probably get the answers to some of the questions he helped me with, even on your podcast, which again, it's awesome for all of you that here, you're learning, educating yourself. Uh, but it was enough for me to be able to get that extra boost of confidence. So I, I went out from there, there and started acquiring properties many of them in C-class properties, properties where it wasn't the best neighborhoods, they weren't the easiest properties in the world to manage. But the flip side of that is in a tougher area with tougher properties to manage, I found it was easier to find sellers who might be willing to, to jump in and help out with some of the financing. I mean, I did a 12-unit property where they were getting a divorce, they wanted out from another property because of the divorce, the two owners. They actually brought $10,000 to closing to make the deal work. They paid me $10,000 to buy their property basically. Interesting. So, so you, you found that some rougher properties or, or some class C or worse properties was where you could find some deals or find sellers who are willing to carry that note or do some financing. Right. Right. There were situations where I would go in and I, I found someone, there was a four unit that I found where the two guys that owned it, they, they had met the broker that brought me the deal. They had met him at a, a baseball card trading convention. His, the broker's son was into base, trading baseball cards. And he met these guys and he realized that they had this property. They, they really should have never owned it. They weren't running it as a business. They weren't doing some of the basic things that, you know, if you run a property correctly, it's not a big deal. If you don't run it as a business, it can get to be a nightmare. And so they were kind of living the nightmare. And basically, I went in on that property and just took over the existing financing, started making the payments on it, and owned it for about four years, and then sold that one, made $82,000 on it. So I think probably for a lot of people, getting out there and getting that first deal done, whether it's a smaller property, like I started off with doing a duplex, and then I think the next one was a four unit, and then a seven, and I kind of went up from there. Or if you are doing a small piece of a deal, if you can become involved in the syndication process and do one little piece of a much bigger deal to where you've got that feeling that, yes, I am a real estate investor. I'm doing this. I'm making it happen. I think that's critical. It's, it's getting some momentum, isn't it? Getting that first property and getting some confidence. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So, so now, you know, you, you were, you're ready to leave your mechanic job now and you, you've, you've found this other property, you're making some money. You can really see that there, this can be a business. And then, but from there to, to where you're at now, or maybe over the next few years after that, you really uh, grew that business, obviously. Uh, but what, what was your focus? What type of, of real estate and, and how did that business uh, grow during that time? Well, I basically uh, developed the, the portfolio with C-class neighborhood properties like that in the multi-units. I've done a, a number of, of uh, techniques as well with single family homes over the years. After I'd been investing about seven years in 1997, I started teaching and mentoring people and I actually have mentored thousands of people all across the country. And one of the things that we used to do was we would work with people and help them get their first couple deals. So the fun part about that is I was able to be involved in all these different deals across the country 
and had a lot of different situations and things that came up where we could try out different strategies. And I, I'll admit it here, I'd had students who came to me with a problem that I hadn't solved before, and I would give them my best ideas and advice and say, hey, why don't you go try this? And then they'd hop on the call the next week and I'd get to find out how it turned out. Oh, it didn't turn out well. Okay, well, I'm not going to give that advice anymore. Or it did work out. Great. Tell me more about that. So it's fun through the years to be able to, to be involved in so many deals all across the country and so many different types of people, um, which is one of the reasons I keep my hand in it now. I, I mentor just a handful of students each year right now, even though I'm, for the most part, mostly retired. I travel around the country, visit my grandkids. And uh, uh, I was actually injured, injured my leg uh, pretty badly or pretty well, depending on how you tell the story, about six years ago and had some nerve damage in my leg. And so it wasn't healing up. And I decided I was going to hike the entire Appalachian Trail from Georgia all the way to Maine and actually did that in an attempt to see if I could make my leg better, which it actually helped a ton. And I'm still in the process, even though that was over six years ago, I'm still in the process of doing some regular rehab on my leg, uh, which is, it's actually a good thing. It's happened to me. It's got me back in shape and condition and some of the best shape of my life. So. Wow. Okay. So, so, you know, I'll, many people that are, I know that are listening are looking to do what you did and go from that W2, whether it's a mechanic, you know, whatever that W2 position is that they have and wanting to go to that millionaire position in three and a half years. But, you know, and it's to me, you're like, hey, you know, where do I even start, Peter? You know, I'd, I'd love to, I love this syndication model. I'd love to be buying apartments, you know, or talking to investors. But, uh, but I just, you know, I don't feel like I can even do that or I don't have the confidence yet. Um, you know, what, you know, from your experience now, you've coached many people through this process. You know, what do they need to do to get this, get this in their mind that, hey, you know, I can do this and I got to start creating some traction? Well, I think beyond the basics of, of being able to, through books or courses or just listening to podcasts, get enough information to be able to know how to value a, a uh, multi-unit property using a cap rate formula at least would be one of the, the very first things that you would need to do. And the best way to do that is to learn what the formulas are and then go out and apply them. Call up some brokers or get some properties off LoopNet and take the, the, prop, the income and expenses and and do the math on it to figure out what you feel that the property is worth so you can get more comfortable with that. The next step and one of the things that I urge my clients to do is find ways that they can get connected directly with a seller of a property. Now, if a property is listed with a broker, as you know, uh, a lot of times these brokers aren't too willing to, to turn over the phone number or contact information of one of their listings to someone that just they just met that morning. But what I found is that through a combination of doing some things so you can connect with owners yourself directly and there's things you can do you can mail mail sellers uh, even better just go knock on some doors talk to some tenants find out what the sellers or the owner's phone number is and call them up up yourself directly or go to a apartment and owners association if you can find one in your area and meet some other people there that own properties and just start a conversation a dialogue with them yourself directly as far as being able to connect directly with sellers on properties that are listed, one of the things we found is helpful is getting an offer out on the property that you know probably isn't going to get accepted. It's not a super low ball offer, but a, a lower than, let's say, the, the seller or broker expected offer. And when that offer isn't accepted, what we say to the broker is, hey, we can probably put this deal together. Is there any way that we could all get together and just put our heads together on this? You, you, the broker, myself, and the owner of the property, do you have a conference room or something we could sit down and meet in and find a way that all three of us could get together? And I found that when we do that, that's the quickest way for us all to get to the closing so we can all get paid. And with that language pattern, what I'm doing is I'm pushing the broker's buttons on talking about getting his commission paid. You know, I'm doing it in a way where I'm respecting and, and, uh, making the broker feel comfortable that we're not going to go around them. We're not going to try and put some deal together directly with a seller where the broker isn't compensated. Yeah. It's in his conference room, right? I mean, I like how right. you worded that uh, and, and it's not threatening. It's not, Hey, can you just give me the number so I can talk to him myself? You know, it's, Hey, can, yeah. Can we use your conference room? And so we can make this happen. That's yeah. Awesome. And I, I found that from a negotiating standpoint, when you're doing deals, and this is for any type of property, whether it's a single family home or a, or a big uh, commercial triple net property, 
if you can find out really what's going on. So one of my favorite questions for the, the broker or the owner, if you're talking to, to it directly is, wow, this just seems like a wonderful property. Don't they all look wonderful when you look at the pro formas and the information that they give you up front? Just looks like a wonderful property. Why would you ever consider selling it? And then you just shut up at that point and listen. And you may not get the right answer right up front, but if you, if you are engaged and, and can create a connection with the seller, create a little bit of rapport. One of the things that I've encouraged my students to do over the years is if you can find someone that's been in real estate a long time and you can help them to see you as a younger version of themselves, they see you, uh, for, for people who are listening, if you feel like you're maybe not old enough to be making money in commercial real estate, you need to use your youth to your advantage. You, if you can get the seller or the owner of the property to see you as a younger version of themselves who is willing to go out despite not having done hundreds of deals, despite not having millions of dollars in the bank that you have to work with capital-wise, you're willing to go out and say, I believe in commercial real estate and I want to buy your property and here's why. Can you help me come up with some ways to do that or how can we figure that out together? It, it really makes it where rather than an adversarial relationship, it, it's much more encouraging the, the seller and you to kind of step together onto the si same side of the table and put together a deal that works for everybody. Wow. So what are some, I mean, multifamily has been your focus, right? Yeah, multifamily, uh, for the most part, I have done a variety of other uh, commercial asset types. Uh, for example, I own a, a part of a shopping center down in El Paso, Texas right now, which has been a great investment. And I've also been involved in helping people with um, single family homes all across the country. We, we've done, we used to teach a lot of lease option type stuff. And interestingly enough, I found that with a commercial property, not with something that's a, a retail deal and they're in no rush to sell it, but if you find a property owner who's motivated and has a problem they want solved, sometimes you can put that together by doing basically a lease option on a piece of commercial real estate. It's called a master lease. And it's something that can be very effective. Again, it's not going to work just calling up a broker that doesn't know you and saying, hey, I want to do this deal. Uh, but if you find the right seller who has the right situation, one of the things that I, I've seen drive master lease deals before is the fact that when someone's selling their property, if they've owned it for 23 years or, or 40 years, the property's fully depreciated. If they sell it, they're going to have to recapture all of the depreciation that they've taken over the years and they're going to have a fairly good tax bill unless of course they do a 1031 over into another property if someone's getting on in their years and they really don't want to own more property you can structure a master lease agreement where they're getting ongoing income from that property they don't have to worry about any of the day-to-day -day stuff you take care of that for them and the title actually changes hands after they pass on and that ends up saving their children uh, quite a bit of money in taxes they would have to pay otherwise. Now, wow. people don't do deals just for tax reasons, so we don't lead in with that. But that's one of the things that once you get talking to them and trying to explore different opportunities, we use language like, well, gosh, I don't know if this would work or not. But in another, another property, a friend of mine was talking about um, on the podcast I was listening to the other day, put together a deal that was structured something like this. They came in and they basically paid X amount for the property each and every month, the same amount. So you wouldn't have a, a month where it's costing you and then you make more one month and then you've got big expenses the next month. You'd have a secure, steady income for the property every single month. I'll collect the rents. I'll take care of paying all the expenses, even the property taxes, and you'll get your set amount each and every month. All we need to do is agree on what that amount is. And of course, a fair price that I can agree to cash you out of the property at some point, we need to figure out when that date would be. Interesting. So, so when looking at deals though, or and let's say, you know, now as experienced as, as you are, well, what are some major just deal breakers just initially, you know, two or three things that, okay, you know, if this isn't this, or if this isn't this way, I'm not going further. Well, generally the deals I'm involved in, uh, I tend to be pretty picky about the clients I work with because I'm just working with, with uh, five or six of them at a time each year. I generally am not working with someone who, who started out with very little money like I did originally. I had $1,500 in the bank when I got started with my investing. I like them to have at least enough money that they could have some 
some skin in the game if they're putting together a deal and bringing other investors, say. And I think in this environment that we have going on right now where cap rates are getting compressed and it seems like it's getting more and more competitive, the more tools you have to put a deal together, the better your chances are of making a, a deal that's really a win-win for everybody. So generally, we'll go out and uh, oftentimes make an offer to do a more conventional deal where it's a 20 or 30% down payment and then new financing. And we'll also engage in uh, talking with the seller. Again, if we can do it directly with the seller while keeping the broker respected and, and apprised of what's going on, you can sometimes put together a deal. If someone's price sensitive and they're not willing to drop on their price, they might go ahead and do a creative deal where maybe they do carry back the financing themselves just because they can have that feeling of, I, I wanted to sell my property for $5 million or whatever it is that's driving them. They get to win on, uh, one of the things I learned many, many years ago was you can have your price or you can have your terms, but you can't really have both. So it's working between those two dynamics. Nice. So, you know, in your experience and obviously uh, the success you've had and obviously coach, coaching so many people, you know, what's really been the hardest part of either, you know, the syndication process or, or just purchasing commercial property in, in general uh, for you? I think, I think probably uh, something that took me a number of years to learn and something that I, I need to drive into some of the students I'm working with is you know it's one thing to listen to or read a book about syndication and say, great, I'm just gonna find other people, doctors or dentists or people that wanna make higher rates of returns. Understanding that if someone's going to invest in your deal, they're really investing in you and they need to know, like, and trust you before you ever even get to explain to them what their rate of return might be. A, a lot of people have the feeling that, well, I, you know, I talk to people sometimes and, and they've never done a deal before they don't have any background or experience in real estate and they somehow want to be able to go out and do a $20 million deal and bring investors into it when they, when they haven't taken the time to take the baby steps and get going first, which is why I encourage people to, you know, get out there, maybe do some smaller properties on their own or do a, do a, a, a buy, find a 10 unit property that you can maybe find one money person to go in and your deal with that money person is you put up the money, I found the deal. I'll put in all the work and effort and we'll split the profits on it 50-50. Now, you can get a better deals than that with investors in the future, but be willing to give more than you need to in the beginning just to get your feet wet and start to develop yourself as an experienced investor rather than someone that, that comes across as a, a real greenie. No, I like that. And, and, but what's a way that, uh, that you've recently improved your business that we could apply to ours? I think probably for, for most people here, uh, one of the things that you could do if you're not doing it already is go 100% paperless. I use Evernote is kind of my filing box in the sky. And I, I just keep everything in there. When I write a check, I take a picture with my phone and save it in Evernote. So all my accountant has to do is go into Evernote and pull up all my checks and they know where the money went and what, what it was used for. Same thing with uh, business and accounting. I tend to, for my, each of my different entities, I have a different credit card that I use. So any of the expenses for that property or that entity are billed to that one credit card. And I don't have to try and figure that out at the end. I can just turn that over to my accountant afterwards and have them do the legwork of putting it into QuickBooks and, and making it all come out right on the tax forms. Nice. So why Evernote? I know there's other platforms like OneNote and, and different things. Sure. There's, there's a number and I'm sure they probably, there's someone could maybe argue they like one better than the other. I got started at one point with Evernote and, and you know, the thing is once you've started keeping all your stuff there for a number of years, then they kind of got you from that point on. So uh, that's why I decided using them. The other thing that the other one tool that I was sharing with, with uh, people on my email list recently was something called last pass, last pass. And that's a password tool that you have one super duper uh, fragilistic password that you can't forget because they, they're not going to send it to you if you forget it. And as long as you know that one password, you can keep all your websites and, and vendors and websites you need to log in and training courses and things all in one place. And it just really simplifies life and is much more secure than keeping them in an Excel spreadsheet or Word document. My wife used to have a Word document that was called passwords. Oh, so not too secure. 
a great thing about that site too is that you can share passwords and and like with teammates and the teammate not know the password you know the last Absolutely. pass will log in for you then you can remove those privileges when they don't need access anymore uh, so that, i thought that was i use that as well a lot um, but yeah, we've done one, that and um, we've had good, good experience finding vendors on upwork uh, yeah. upwork.com you obviously have to try them out the trick with upwork is you need to look at the the reviews and People always get five star reviews, but you need to look at the comments and say, is this like a, we weren't really happy, but we're just giving them a five star review because we, you know, we don't want to upset them and, and tip the cart, or is this really someone that they actually would hire again? And uh, the other nice thing about Upwork is you can hire someone, get them on a small job, pay them 50, 100 bucks, doing something, see how it turns out. If they, if they don't do a good job, you haven't lost much and you can test people out. We'll sometimes hire three different people to do the same job because we know chances are one or two of them may not do the job to our standards and we'll end up still with one that we can use long-term. Uh, what's your best advice for caring for investors? Oh, caring for investors. I think probably the biggest thing is to stay in touch with them. Uh, I've found that with investors I worked with over the years, I've, I've made the mistake at times of even people that I knew really well, just if I, any time that I settled back into, well, I don't need to contact them. I don't need to update them on the property. They know it's in good hands. I found that investors, if they don't hear from you, they, they tend to start to fear the worst. So just staying in touch on a regular basis, basis, even if it's just a quick little email or a text or a call just to say, hey, everything's going fine. We uh, just put a new roof on top of the, the, uh, the one property there at the shopper center, shopping center or whatever it is, a quick little update everything's going fine. And um, I found that that is the one thing that people don't do. Once they get a deal put together, they tend to forget about the investors until it's time to send them their annual report. Wow. And what's the one thing that's contributed to your success, Peter? I think the one thing that's contributed to my success more than anything else is a willingness to get out there and um, be willing to step out and take the next step. If I can just figure the next step in front of me, I don't need to know all 20 or 30 or 50 or in some of these complex syndication deals, there's, as you know, hundreds and hundreds of steps. Um, I've always felt that if I could figure out how just to take the next step, if I can take that next step, then chances are good. I'm going to be able to figure out the next step after that. And uh, there's some people out there that they want to get into real estate, but they want to learn everything about real estate before they get out there and take their first step. And I've, I've been, gosh, I started back in 1990 and I'm still learning about real estate. That's what makes it so much fun and so challenging and so interesting to be around is that there's always new things that happen and different ways to put a deal together, which is why I love still being involved with it today. Wow. Well, uh, Peter, you've been a great guest. I really appreciate you elaborating on your, your path from mechanic to millionaire. I know, like I said, so many of the listeners would love to make that same path and get to where, uh, where you are. Uh, but, but before we go, tell, tell the listeners uh, how you like to give back. Uh, well, if I can do nothing more than just encourage you right now here on the show as you're listening to this, if I can make it where I started off as an auto mechanic, then you can most certainly do this too. So when you get frustrated, remember, hey, if Peter could do it, I can too. Um, and I'm sorry, your question was where, where, where do I like to give back? Or Yeah, just how you like to give back. Yeah, right now I'm doing that a number of ways. Um, I think one of the ways that I do it is, is by selecting a few people each year that I can actually work with personally and take them by the hand and we end up, end up going out and doing deals together. And that's not only very helpful to them, but it's, it's very rewarding to myself because I get to see the excitement that happens when someone goes out and gets their first or second or third property in place. And I, I've just always gotten a kick out of that. I mean, if I went and did the same deal on my own, it wouldn't be nearly as much fun. Right, right. And how can the listeners get in touch with you and learn more about you? They could go to peterconti.com or as a, a special uh, gift for those of you listening to this, if any of you would like to get a free copy of my commercial real estate investing for dummies book that I'm the co-author of, you can simply go to Peter, petersfreebook.com and you can get the details there. Awesome. Thank you very much, Peter. Hey, thanks for having me on the show and thanks for all of you listening. Go out, make today a great day. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate. 
while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.